this huge slab of just poured concrete. And I'm looking at it, I thought, wow, you can write in this. <laughs> hey, isn't this cool? I might not have said cool when I was nine. <laughs> Apparently that, you know, don't use that kind of language, young man, in 1969 coming from my World War II veteran father. So I decided for some strange reason not to write my name in it, but instead to write my next door neighbor's name in it. Okay? <laughs> and so I wrote that in like, I don't know, foot high letters, David. Then I went home. <laughs> now y'all just hold on to that thought for a minute. This morning in our reading from Exodus, we are presented with this passage, very powerful passage from Exodus. Moses has gone up onto the mountain and he has come down with the law to present to God's chosen people. The children of Israel led out of bondage into the land of promise, although at the moment they are still wandering in the wilderness, and he has brought them the great stone tablets of the law. Now while he was upon the mountain receiving the law, he had asked God if he could actually see the face of God. And God said, no, but if you will stand in this cleft of rock as I walk past, I'll put my hand up so you don't look upon my face, but you will be able to see my back as I walk by. And so he does that. And Moses, when he goes down from the mountain, his face is glowing with the reflected glory of the revealed God, the Shekinah glory of God. It is dazzling white. It is bright. And it says the people of Israel were afraid to look upon not the face of God, but the reflected glory of of God. Now, that's the preface that's used as we move toward transfiguration, but we really need to look at this moment from Exodus a little bit deeper. You see, this is the second time that Moses has come down from the mountain with the tablets of the law. Okay? The first time he comes down. And the, the people of Israel, he's been on the mountain so long, they've not known what to do. They have actually built the golden calf to worship. And enraged, Moses shatters the tablets of the law. Just as an aside, do you know what was done with the broken tablets of the law? They were put inside the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? A little trivia for you. So... They shatter. He shatters the stone tablets. He is outraged. There's a terrible plague that happens to the Israelites. It's a moment of great shame. You see, when Moses is showing his face and they are looking upon the reflected glory of God, it's not awe. It's not love that causes them to look away. It's fear. It's fear because they cannot look in the face of the one that they have lied to, whose trust they have betrayed, whose relationship, well, they've broken. It's really at that moment about guilt. Now the reason I know this without a doubt is because my next door neighbor's dad got home later that evening. And I hear him yelling at my next door neighbor. And for some reason, I thought, I'll just walk over there and see what's going on. <laughs> and so I walked over, and my next door neighbor is having a conversation with his dad, okay? <laughs> because clearly he has written his own name in the wet concrete. And I look at Mr. Newman, and I'm like, no, no, he didn't. And then he turns and he looks at me and I could not look him in the face. I was terrified. So I looked down. Yes, sir, he didn't do it. I did it. You know that part where they say confession is good for the soul? <laughs> I 
I'm unable to look in His face because of His anger, because of my own shame about what I had done. I hadn't really gotten myself in a lot of trouble, but I'd gotten my friend into a, an absolutely desperate amount of trouble. I was embarrassed and I was ashamed and I could not look upon the disappointment and anger of my friend's father. It was the reaction of a child. In a lot of ways, we are always sort of children before God. So we don't have to do some sort of deep theological examination of the text to figure out that the Israelites are embarrassed and afraid and unable to look upon even the reflected glory of God because of the actions that they had taken. You see, it's not about the image of God. It's about their response to the words of God. They had let God down. The one who had freed them from bondage, who had saved them from the Egyptians, who had led them out of captivity, their actions had not reflected His actions. Their actions had not been a living testimony and witness to His words and His instructions. Now, today is Transfiguration Sunday. We step out of the the long season after Pentecost. We step out of ordinary time and into this moment for the second time in a year. Every year we have this reading when? Well, not just Sunday, August 6th or the Sunday closest to it, but we also have it just before we enter into Lent. Just before Jesus turns His face toward Jerusalem, we always have this moment on the mountain of transfiguration. It's a preface and preparation. Actually, it's also, because now remember, we have the season of Epiphany before Lent. Epiphany means manifestation. It's that ultimate manifestation of the reality of Jesus Christ. That's how we enter into Lent, knowing in advance who He truly is. And today, on this Sunday, we step into it because it's a day to understand in the midst of the long year the reality of the identity of Christ. You see, for weeks before and after this, we're going to hear parables. We're going to hear stories of the, the, the actions of Christ in the world. And so here in August, both during and before and, and after all this long period of Jesus' actions taking place, we have this moment to pause and look upon the face of Jesus. Jesus. There's no shame involved in this. There's no embarrassment involved in this. There's no disappointment that's a part of this. We are not chastised children afraid to look upon the face of God. No. We are invited. He takes Peter, James, and John. He says, I want you to come with me. Now remember, the disciples, the apostles, they represent us all. We are all invited into this encounter with the living God. Now, the great church fathers, the great theologians of the church, whether it's Irenaeus or Origen or Augustine, all the way up to John Paul II, they all talk about the transfiguration as being that point where the eternal and the temporal touch. In other words, where heaven and earth touch. And in that moment, we see the fullness of God in Christ. We look upon Him standing there revealed completely. With Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets on either side of Him. And in the midst of that is the full revelation of who Jesus is. But there is a 
a slight danger here. A slight danger. Actually, perhaps more than slight. Because there is the tendency that all of us have to kind of get wrapped up in the picture and image and not pay attention to what the picture and the image are trying to communicate. That's when we have to listen to the words of God. To understand this moment, we have to listen to the words of God. What does he say? This is my son, the beloved, the chosen one. Listen to him. God does not say, look at my boy. Glowing and glorious. Isn't that wonderful? God says, listen to Him. He doesn't say, look at Him. He says, listen to Him. He doesn't say, oh how beautiful. He says, pay attention to His Word. So what are His words? Well, His words are all of those things that are happening before this moment, this Sunday, and all of those things that are happening after this moment, this Sunday. And you sum it all up the way He summed it up. Jesus says in John, Love one another as I have loved you. Which means, when God says, Listen to Him, You hear Jesus say things like, forgive, seven times seventy, infinitely forgive. You hear Jesus say, let the person who has no sin be the one that casts the first stone. You hear Jesus say, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. You see, it's not enough to have this glorious awareness of the transformative power of Jesus as an image, whether it's His life or your own life. I attended a breakfast one time with a group of Christian, that's, those are quotations, air quotations, um, Christian businessmen, okay? I got invited to this thing. And I went to it, and I listened to the folks talking about their own personal stories, okay? Uh, that, uh, that, that special witness about their conversion experience. The problem was that while they had had these extraordinary conversion experiences, they were still pretty rotten and horrible in their dealings with their workers. And they were sitting there talking about ways to save money by underpaying people. They were talking about ways to make additional money by charging for additional services that were unnecessary. But they had all had this marvelous, wonderful conversion experience. So they had this image. But it's not about the image. It's about the words. Listen to Him. And so we go back to what Jesus has to say. Over the next few weeks, we will have story after story. We'll have parable after parable. We will have instruction after instruction. It's never about just the transformation on the outside. It's about, for you and I, the transformation on the inside. Having seen Jesus, it comes down to this. What are we going to do? Amen.